Numbers 12. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And I believe that they were probably jealous about this woman's influence on Moses, and especially Miriam. She seems most guilty in what we're getting ready to read here. And Miriam was the older sister. And some of you have an older sister, so you can understand that. And they said, verse 2, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And reality was, the Lord had spoken by them. Uh, Miriam had part in helping to save Moses as a baby, so I'm sure he felt indebted. And God had used her, Exodus chapter 15, verse 20, calls Miriam a prophetess. And she knew God, I believe that. And I believe that she led the women spiritually. We know that from Exodus 15. And so you have Aaron here, his brother, Exodus chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, the older brother, the spokesman, and the Lord had spoken by him. In Numbers chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we know Aaron is the father of the priesthood. And in Micah chapter 6 and verse 4, the Bible says this, For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Which is interesting. God said, I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So when they spoke in verse 2 and said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? There was some validity to what they were saying. But the problem was they had a wrong spirit, and Miriam in particular. And here's what the Bible says in verse 2, And the Lord heard it. And that was a problem for Miriam and Aaron. May I remind you, the Lord hears what we say, and the Lord hears what's in our hearts. We don't have to articulate. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But before it comes out of our lips, God knows what's in our heart. And he knew what was going on here. And the problem was, in verse 2 here, they become negative. And then they become critical. And then they become proud. My dad says this, if you're negative, you're halfway to critical. And the idea of becoming negative and critical and proud, the Lord heard it. And God was upset. So let's keep reading here. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then, were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous, and Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us wherein we have done foolishly and wherein we have sinned. You can see Aaron looking at Miriam and thinking, I don't want that to happen to me. So he starts crying out to Moses, Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that, let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again, and afterward the people were moved from Hazareth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. So here I see this story. It's an amazing story in the Bible. And because of time tonight, I'm not going to develop it fully, but you've read it, you're familiar with it. Miriam and Aaron, they speak against Moses. And Moses is a man who deals with this situation, deals with his critics in a way that did please God. And I want you to notice verse 3 here. Now the man Moses was very, what's that next word, church? Meek. Moses was very meek. You might mark that statement in your Bible. Moses was very meek. 
And the Lord's pressed my heart tonight to preach a simple thought. The greatness of meekness. The greatness of meekness. I believe America has a pride problem. I believe all of our sin ultimately can find its root in pride. And we have a pride problem in our nation. Because of that, God resisted the proud. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. May I dare suggest, I believe the reason why, America, we've become proud. Sadly, Christianity and our churches, there's been a spirit of pride that has arisen through the decades in our own local churches. I believe it's very similar to what we would see with the Laodicean church age and in Revelation chapter 3 where they thought they were rich and they thought they were clothed and they thought they could see and the Lord said, no, no, you're poor and you're blind and you're naked. But they were puffed up. And that church, that Laodicean church age, and dispensationally, I'm not sure what you believe, but I believe that's where we're at. I believe it's the end time, and I believe that's the plague of our nation, that we have so much pride. And I believe oftentimes we've had that pride as part of our church, and I'm not here to rip on preachers, but preachers tonight, may I challenge you, may I challenge myself, we need a revival of humility amongst the men of God. I'm 56, as it was already mentioned. I got saved at eight years old. My dad, mom, got saved in 1975. And I was, by God's grace, raised in some of the heyday with a lot of great things going on in our nation. Some of you are aware of that, and you lived through that, and you were part of it, and some of you led in it. And I thank God for the good old days, but watch this. We're in the present moment right now, as it's already been said, for such a time as this. And we need an anointing from God. We need something that can help our nation. Brother Wells' video tonight started out with him quoting 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. If my people, which are called by name, Brother Cranston, shall humble themselves. And I don't know what you think about our nation, but I understand, as it's been said by all of us at some point, the hope is not in the White House. The hope is in the church house. We need a revival that comes from God. It's the ultimate answer. The gospel is the answer. And we need a revival of the same type spirit that Moses had as a leader. He was meek. He was meek. I think the word meekness is understated oftentimes. Now, if you really look at it in the Bible, it's not really understated in God's word, but it's not one that we put a lot of focus on. I think partly the word meek rhymes with weak. And sometimes people hear that and they think that, but it's actually the opposite. How many of you would agree that Moses is one of the greatest leaders in the Word of God? Would you agree with that? And here he is. He's called a meek man. And I want you to notice here, this idea of meekness is so essential, so important. Meekness means to be humble. It means to be lowly in mind. I don't mean you put a bag over your head and you don't come out, I'm a nothing. No, no, no. It's talking about as God uses you and uses your gift set to influence that we keep a humble spirit, lowly in mind, not puffed up, not vain, not about ourselves. It's the idea of gentle while being humble. Meekness is being patient when injured by others. Patient when injured by others. How many of you don't like a lot of what you see going on in our country? All right, would you agree with that? How many of you sometimes feel like you want to go choke some people who are doing the wrong thing in our land? Right? But that meekness, and by the way, local church pastor who maybe had somebody criticize you yesterday in the church house, uh, it's a patience when injured by others. It's part of meekness. Meekness is having our authority under the Spirit's control. Meekness is having our authority. Now you say, well, I'm not a pastor. Well, maybe you're a dad, maybe you're a husband. You ladies here, your moms. And the idea would be, some of you, and, and the idea would be meekness is having our authority under the Spirit's control, not just going off, but being Spirit-led. Meekness is humbling our spirit under the God-given authorities in our life. Which, may I remind you, does include, Romans 13, that we are subject to those who are leaders in government. 
And I understand at times we ought to obey God rather than man. During COVID, some of you knew our story. We ended up suing our governor. I didn't want to do that. I want to thank God for Dr. Gibbs and CLA and how they helped lead us through that whole process. I never thought I'd be suing the governor. We said, why did you sue? Because we were ticketed for opening church five times. My dad and I, Pastor Andy Reese there in New Jersey, they ticketed us for opening up the church. We did all the protocol beyond anything anybody else was doing. But ultimately, listen, we needed to meet. We needed to have church. And that was a situation where we had to obey God rather than man. Some of you have asked about that. Long story short, ultimately, the governor dropped the charges. So I take that as a victory. We wanted to get it established in the Supreme Court, but ultimately, he dropped the charges. Said, you can't open church. We said, we must open church. We did open church, and ultimately, he dropped them. Governor Murphy, you pray for Governor Murphy, all right? Some of you that think it's bad living in North Carolina as compared to New Jersey. Meekness is humbling ourselves under the God-given authorities in our life. Meekness is our practical humility. Would you think with me? Meekness is our practical humility. It's our demonstrated humility. And it is biblical and it is essential. Moses was accused of being proud, but he wasn't proud. Here's my question. Are we proud? Are we proud? Now, I know you're the people that would come all the way to D.C., I know this church family's got a servant's heart. They've got a servant's heart here. But ultimately, ultimately, how many of you know pride is very subtle and it can creep into our lives? Everybody hear me tonight, please. You preachers, I, I'd love to preach something more dynamic and about the gospel tonight. This is what the Lord pressed me about that I need, that we need, and in this moment and for this meeting. So would you please listen to God's word as we look here? We need to make sure that we have the right position, but we also need to have the right disposition. We need to take the right stand, but we need to do it with the right spirit. I've heard Dr. Gibbs say that numerous times. As we were in our battle, he said we need to take the right stand, but we need to have the right spirit. And that is essential, and the spirit we should have is one of meekness. How good was it in Moses' life? Look in verse 3. You see where the Lord spake suddenly in verse 4. But in verse 3, the Bible says this is an amazing statement. Now, the man Moses was, how meek, everybody, help me, was very meek. Well, how much is very meek? Well, look at this statement. I find this amazing. Above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Can you imagine being number one in the world at anything? And we know God did not get this wrong. He got it right. This was not God misspoke about Moses. But notice that's an amazing thing. The meekest man in all the earth. Maybe that's a primary reason why God ultimately chose Moses. Because he knew he could trust Moses. So that when God used Moses to lead God's people, Moses ultimately would give God the glory. May I suggest, we need God to deliver us like he walked those people out of Egypt. We as Christian people in America right now, we need a revival, something supernatural, something that only could be done by God himself. It's not going to happen with men God can't trust. And God could trust Moses. Do you understand the spirit we're talking about is about complete polar opposite of much of the spirit of Washington, D.C.? Is that fair to say? You pastor there six blocks from the Capitol? You know what that is ultimately? Not all of our politicians, and thank God for those that are safe, but you know what that ultimately is? It's the pride of life, the desire to be. May I remind you, we're not supposed to go downtown tomorrow and walk in like we're all that in a bag of chips. Come on, right? Well, brothers, we're the Baptist preachers here, and, they, you know, and we want to be big dogs. No, no, we serve a big God. But I don't know about you, I'm a worm, I'm a dog, I'm a flea. I'd have split hell wide open and would, if not for the grace of God. We don't, know, we don't need to go down there with our whatever talent gift set and try to walk in there and be somebody's. They need to know that we know God. And I'm not going to have God on my life, and you're not going to have God on your life unless we have a meek spirit. You remember Moses went in before Pharaoh. Make the analogy, the application. Where are we going tomorrow? Come on, everybody. 
Who are we and we'd walk in there? Well, we better be someone that has God on our side. And that's going to take meekness because God resists the proud. And verse 4, and the Lord spake suddenly. I want you to notice this. Moses did not speak. God defended Moses. They're speaking against him, his own brother and sister. But God did the speaking for Moses. You know, may God work on our behalf. <laughs> Only by pride comes contention. Moses didn't start this. It was their pride that brought about this contention. But it was diffused by Moses' humility, and God intervened on his behalf. You know, you get your, get your voice as loud as you can. It still won't be loud enough to overcome these enemies. It's only God that can do what we need done and in our nation. Now, how did Moses become so meek? Well, I'll tell you one thing for sure. Look in verse 7. My, Moses, my servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all my house. Notice what God said. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. <laughs> Even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Hey, I'll talk to Moses face to face. I'll talk to him mouth to mouth. Here's the point. Moses was close to God. And closeness breathes likeness. Amen. Watch now. Come on, gentlemen. I'm especially talking to the preachers here tonight. And I'm not hearing that in a negative way, condescending way. I'm one of you. And I'm preaching to me at the same time. We need to be men that are spending much time with God alone so that God can put his touch on our lives. We need something bigger than what we can find in ourselves. I don't want this to sound condescending. I'm not impressed with men. I'm impressed with God. And I know this, I'm a fool if I try to impress men with me. But we serve an impressive God. And Moses knew God. And Moses spoke on behalf of God. And God worked in Moses' behalf. And in your town, in your city, you need a movement of God. And in our nation, we need a movement of God. And we can't work it up, but God could send it down. But he won't do it for a proud man. And he won't do it for a proud people. You look around, you say, well, we're, we're outnumbered. Brother Roloff used to say this, one man on God's side is a majority. Come on. Isn't it God's ability to save by many or by few? Get your chin up. Get your chin up. Thank God. God's able. So here's the question. Do we spend enough time walking with God to be like Moses? How meek are we? But Tyler, why is this so important? Go to Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Thanks for turning. All right. Now, we stayed there. And now we're going to do it sword drill style. Are you all ready? Matthew chapter, tell the person next to you, say, wake up. Nah, you didn't do it. Tell them, say, wake up. Matthew chapter 11, grab your marker, your pen. If it's your habit to mark or underline, I want you to grab this statement if you don't already have it marked. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. The Lord Jesus Christ says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. Here's something to learn. Four, three words together out loud. Ready? I am meek. One more time, would you say that? I am meek. Now, who's speaking these words in this verse? The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am meek. Why is it important to be meek? Because Christ was meek. Do you call yourself a Christian? If so, would you say amen? amen. And the word Christian means to be Christ-like. Can you truly say, I am meek? Because Jesus did. And he said, learn of me. Learn of me. Hey, are you as a preacher still teachable? Are, are you someone that can learn to have this humble spirit, this meek spirit? Look at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And verse 5. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 5. Tell ye the daughter of Sion, behold, I wait. Preacher's supposed to win the sword drill. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. What's the word to describe King Jesus? Help me, everybody. Meek. Do you see that? Meek is in the word of God. 
So our Lord said, I am meek. What a powerful statement. What a convicting statement. What a need in my life and in your life to be Christ-like in our meekness. Isaiah chapter 53, he opened not his mouth. In the garden, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. In Philippians chapter 2, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And think about it, on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Remember meekness, one of those definitions, patience when injured by others. How many of you know he could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. He humbled himself to the will of God. And we need a revival of humbling ourselves to the will of God. Don't be bitter that you live in 2024 and all is not well in America. Look at it as not something, well, I've got to live here. You get to live here. And in this moment, hey, well, I love to study church history and Bible history, and I do too, but this is our page in church history. You say, but yeah, there's not many of us. Hey, we may be the remnant group in, in a gleaning stage, but thank God I still get to serve King Jesus. Amen. And I want to be more like him and less like me. Yeah. Amen. Die to self like John the Baptist, right? He must what? Help me. Increase, but I must decrease. Absolutely. That's our Lord. We should be meek towards God. So I'm going to talk relationships here very quickly. Are you ready? We should be meek towards who? God. Everybody, we should be meek towards God. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse, verse 1 tells us we're to be like obedient children. You ever seen a kindergarten teacher and have one of those tow ropes and all the kids are holding on to that rope? May God help me, may God help you to be obedient to our Lord and follow him with a spirit of meekness. Where he leads me, I will follow, right? So we need to be meek in our spirit towards God. Luke 18, 17 talks about yet to believe as a little child. Remember Solomon when he took over 1 Kings 3, 7? He said, I don't know how to go out or come in. I'm like a child. I'm a child. There's a humility there initially in Solomon's life, that meekness. How about meekness towards God and accepting God's will? How many of you ever made plans and God changes your plans? Have you ever had that happen? Ooh. What do you do? Well, how about Job? What did he say? Hey, though he slay me, yet will I what? Trust him. Trust him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You don't have a church building yet. God must not like you. No, I know God loves him. Hey, the God's developing a faith story right there. Are you with me? At Grace Way and at your place. By the way, this is all point but on point. There are no small churches. There may be smaller in number churches, but every church is a big church that's in the plan of God. So don't be discouraged. We should be meek towards God. We should be meek with our spouse. You say, Brother Charlie, this is a Bible study. It's not a sermon. I know, but it's one we need. Ephesians 5, 25. All you men quote it with me. Husbands, love your wives even as what? Christ also loved the church. How about meekness with our spouse? 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. I can't develop it. Verse 7 we like to talk about the women and them being submissive, but how about the way we love our wives? Don't deal, don't deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. We should be meek with our spouse. We should be meek with our children. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, we go 1 through 3, but what about fathers provoke not your children to wrath? You all with me? Who would provoke children to wrath? Someone that's not meek. Come on. I didn't say don't discipline. I didn't write the Bible. Fathers provoke not your children to wrath. It's the way we do what we do that impacts other people. And we don't need to be a proud, arrogant preacher who's a bull in a china shop. Amen. I've talked to too many preachers' kids, because I am one, still trying to get through bitterness towards parents. Amen. We should be meek with the sheep, our followers. In a local church context, you preachers, 1 Peter 5, 2 through 6, we're not to be lording over. We're to be humble, humble ourselves. Brother Raymond, that's what, the, Raymond, that's what the Bible says, right? Remember how Jesus dealt with people? How about with Peter? I mean, Peter was the ultimate mess up. Three times, I told you you're going to deny. He did deny, but the Lord goes to him, lovest thou me, lovest thou me, lovest thou me. There's a restoration process. Can we all agree with that? You know, when Thomas said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus did not say, you idiot. I've been with you three and a half years. How do you not know where we're going and how to get there? Patience, meekness, humility. I've taught these people. We'll teach them again. And with the right spirit. 
How about us being meek when we deal with our critics? I don't have time to go to all these references. I'm just buzzing through this message. 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 26 through 26. Meek when dealing with our critics. You know, Moses was not vindictive. How many of you saw when we quickly read through there that he prayed for Miriam's healing? Pray for them which despitefully use you. Aren't we supposed to pray for kings and all that are in authority? Amen. Come on now. I mentioned Governor Murphy. I need to pray for him. Well, Brother Clark, he did. No, no, no. That's the governor. God put him there. I need to pray for him. Amen. Those leaders will go in. We're from New Jersey. Well, can I just tell you, we live in a very, very blue state. How blue can blue be? We're, we're as blue as it can get. Uh, some of you know Senator Menendez, right? You know that name. Well, that's our senator. Cory Booker, you know him, right? What, we're going down. What's the goal? We want to see him. Want to talk to him. Want to pray with him. Amen. Some of you got quiet on that. Notice here, we should be meek in dealing with the lost, which ties right in with what I was just saying. Look, old Nicodemus, you know, can a man go into his mother's womb and be born? And you look at that and say, dude, what are you thinking in that question? Right? With the obvious answer. But the Lord was patient with him, brought him along. Woman at the well, she was a little snotty at the beginning of that thing. Who are you? You're a Jew talking to me. And how's that going on? And our father's worship. The Lord could have just shut her down. But he dealt with her with a spirit of meekness. Come on now. Everybody stay with me. I, I, I'm talking about we're in Washington, D.C. tomorrow. And there's a lot of people that could get on your nerves. Amen, Brother Cranston. When I go to Senator Booker's office tomorrow with our other New Jersey people here, they'll have an American flag, they'll have a New Jersey flag, they'll have a rainbow flag, and they'll have a transgender flag. I guarantee it, he'll have four of those out there. I said to our church last night, I like to take the Christian flag in there, march it in, and say, boom, we're going to plant it right there. <laughs> hey, I'm supposed to have a spirit of meekness. But Clark, you're saying don't stand. I'm standing by the grace of God. You're standing by the grace of God. But we better be Christ-like. I am meek. Are you ready? Meek Christians are teachable. How fast can you turn? Can I have 10 minutes? Because he told me I had to be done a quarter after. I know. That's why I'm asking you now. I love you. I will buy you dinner. He's not the boss. He just has to keep everything organized the whole time we're here. And he wants everybody here to go to this meeting afterwards. Is that correct? No, I thought you did. I could tell. He's not going to love me anymore. I'm not going to look at Andrew again. Matthew chapter 25. In 10 minutes, we're going to buzz scriptures right on through. Are you all ready? Come on, tell the person next to you. Say, I'm ready. Matthew, Psalm, Psalm, I'm, I'm in Matthew. Psalm 25. I said, meek Christians. If you're a preacher, would you just make it personal and say, meek preachers? Meek preachers are teachable. It's bad if you can't teach you as an old dog a new trick. Because this Bible always has something new for us to learn. And the will of God. Psalm 25, 9. We'll read this together out loud. Ready? The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Meek Christians are teachable. When's the last time you learned something? I love my dad. He's 78 years old. And he says, I study every day. I study every day. And he studies people. He said, everybody will teach you either what to do or what not to do. But the idea of being teachable. Hey, come on now, let's not act like we've been there, done that, got the t-shirt on, everything. Every day is a fresh day from God. We can always be learning. And meek people are teachable. Have you kept your teachable spirit? Go to James 1, sword drill style. James chapter 1. Come on, come on, come on. James chapter 1. And we know meek Christians receive the Bible with an open heart. I can't develop all these, but you know them. James 1.20, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Well, I'm going to get mad about it. Okay. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with, help me, church, meekness, the what? Engrafted words, which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Meek Christians receive the Bible with an open heart. The engrafted word. Notice that. Are you receiving the word of God? Even tonight, are you willing to receive whatever it is that God gives you through the scriptures as you read them tonight? Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. I'll just mention this. You know it already. Fruit of the Spirit is meekness. Do you see that in verse 23? Galatians 5, 23. The fruit of the Spirit, everybody, is meekness. 
So meek Christians, meek preachers, show meekness on the branches of your life. It ought to be a demonstrated thing. It ought to be something where other people, by the way, could reap the benefits of picking that off the branches of your life to be the recipient of that fruit of the Spirit in your life. Meekness. Are you a blessing to anyone by your meekness? We ought to be. It's essential. It's important. Meek Christians put on their meekness like they put on clothing. Look in Colossians chapter 3, please. Colossians chapter 3. Meek Christians put their meekness on like you put on clothing. If I said to you, did you put on your meekness today? Colossians chapter 3. Pick up, if you would, verse 12. Colossians 3, 12. Put on, therefore, so here we go, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. Everybody help me. What's the next word? Meekness. Put on meekness. Did you put on your meekness today? Did you put on your meekness today? We should. Meek Christians follow after meekness. They pursue it. They follow after meekness. They pursue it. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, please. Thanks for turning. I'm preaching six more minutes. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And pick up verse 11, please. 1 Timothy 6, 11. Could I have all the preachers read this together with me out loud? Ready? But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, Love, patience, meekness. Man of God, follow after meekness. That means you're in pursuit of it. Everybody with me? You're, you're chasing after it, man. It's something I, I, I need to really get now. If I said, preachers, there's a million dollars buried out on that side yard somewhere. You wouldn't even wait for the invitation. Come, and don't add, adjust your halo. You know it's the truth. And I'd be right next to you. We'd be out there digging with our hands. Why? Oh, man, a million dollars, that's valuable. God says pursue meekness. Meekness. Are you pursuing meekness? Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 3, we won't go there, is also the idea of pursuing meekness. Meek Christians are wise Christians. Go back to James. James chapter 3, make wise Christians. We need an increase in wisdom. We all know that. It's the principal thing. Get wisdom. We're taught that. James chapter 3, meek Christians are wise Christians. James 3, 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? How do, how do we know it? Let him show out of a good conversation, his manner of life, his behaviors, his works with, everybody help me, what's it say? Meekness of wisdom. Meekness of wisdom. So a meek man is going to be a wise man, and a truly wise man is a meek man. Meek Christians promote unity in the body of Christ. Go ahead and look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Come on, sword drill style, preachers. Turn with me. Come on. So you're picking on the preachers tonight. A little bit. Ephesians chapter 4. Meek Christians promote unity in the body of Christ. I need to be preached to. I have, a, I have an advantage at our church. If I preach Sunday night, my dad preaches Sunday morning, and we flip each week. So I get preached to all the time. Preachers need preaching. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Well, what's the spirit? Notice, with all lowliness and, help me, meekness. With long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Everybody help me on three. Ready? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You know, we'd have more unity as Bible believers if we have more meekness. Well, Clark, I'm an independent Baptist. I don't believe in unity. <laughs> Brother Luke, you've been through some things in your life, right? Absolutely. Watch. Hey, Brother Clark, I'm a separatist. So am I. I'm all for it, and I understand, and I, again, I've been raised, quote, unquote, in our movement. I get it, but there ought to be a whole lot more unity than what there is. And there would be if there'd be more meekness in our hearts. If it's fruit of the Spirit... And you have the same spirit I have, and we're both producing meekness, you'd think there'd be more unity. Amen. I'm off of it. That went over like a lead balloon. Galatians chapter 6. How about this? Meek Christians have a heart to restore others. Meek Christians have a heart to restore others. Galatians 6 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are who? Spiritual, do what? Restore such an one. In what type of spirit? In the spirit of meekness. Why? Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Well, I saw that coming in that brother's life. Well, what did we do to stop it? Well, I never saw that coming. And then they bit the dust. What are we doing to help them up? 
including ultimately maybe they can't even have the place that they had with what they were doing, that doesn't mean we should stop loving. Spirit of meekness, restoring. Boy, we ought to have this in our heart. Meek Christians are lifted up by God. They don't have to lift up themselves. Look in Psalm 147, please. Home stretch, we're turning the curve. Psalm 147, meek Christians are lifted up by God. Notice verse 6, where this is ultimately David promoted, was promoted over Saul. Psalm 147, verse 6. Everybody read that first statement together with me. Ready? The Lord lifteth up the meek. Wow. He lifteth up the meek. See, if you have the right heart, I mentioned this is David the psalmist. What did he do when he killed Goliath? You all know that all the earth may know that there's a David. No, that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. And may God know in your town, and may God know in your family, may, may everybody know in your family that you know God and God knows you. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. That's not so that we're in the spotlight. Christ is the only one that deserves preeminence. It's so that God would give us influence as salt and light, and for the gospel's sake, that we can see something happen in our day. God, give us revival. Oh, it may not be national revival, but let it be in my life and let it be in my family and let it be in our church family so that my children and grandchildren could grow up seeing the work of God and not a work of Clark. So here's the question. Are you humble? Are you meek? Are you lowly in mind? Are you gentle? Are you patient when injured by others? Do you have your spirit under the Spirit's control? Are you humbling your spirit under the God-given authorities in your life? Are you like Moses as a leader? Or are you ultimately like Christ? Because he's the one that said, I am meek. I am meek. If I ask your best people, the best people that know you, family, friends, etc., hey, describe them. How long would it take before somebody called you meek? I'll give you the benefit of death. They don't normally use that word. How long would it be before they called me humble or called you humble because of spirit disposition? I shouldn't do this, but I will. Pastor John Wilkerson's face just jumped in my mind. You know who he is? He's a meek man. I didn't say weak. He's one of the strongest leaders I know, if you actually get to know him. He's got a spine of steel. Meekness. Father, help me. Help us. Lord, help us not to go downtown tomorrow trying to impress people with who we are. Oh, God, may these leaders see in us something different, someone different. And help us put.